The story you are about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts featuring historical characters, events, or places that has played a role in shaping history. Please sit back and listen as I recite this narrative for you. Marie Besnord, also known as the Good Lady of Loden. For years, the Besnord family had suffered from what locals called the Besnord family jinx. With members of the family dying left and right, authorities became suspicious of Leon Besnord's wife Marie, as she was soon the only family member left standing. In 1896, Marie Josephine Philippine de Vellaud was born in Loudon, France. Her parents were considered frugal and she attended a convent school for her education. Those who went to school with Marie describe her as immoral, vicious, a thief, and a girl who ran wild with the boys. In 1920, Marie married August Antigny, her cousin, and they remained married until his death in 1927. Marie went on to marry Leon Besnard in 1928 rather quickly following the death of her first husband, August. They settled into a moderate lifestyle that both soon came to resent. His parents had inherited a fortune not long after Marie and Leon married. Not long after, Leon's parents inherited a lot of money. They were invited to come and live with Leon and Marie. Soon after, Leon's father died of poisoning, supposedly from eating the wrong kind of mushrooms. Just three months later, his mother also died, and the cause was given as pneumonia. The money that his parents had inherited went to Leon and his sister Lucy. Unsurprisingly, a few months after she got the money, Lucy also died, apparently committing suicide. Around the same time, Marie Besnard's father died, officially of a cerebral hemorrhage and would later be found to have been poisoned. The money from Lucy Besnard went to her brother and his wife, now making them exceptionally wealthy, no doubt the motive for all of the suspicious deaths that surrounded them. The couple ended up subletting some rooms to a couple who were wealthy and without children. The Rivets, Toussaint, and Blanche were friends of Leon's. On July 14, 1939, Toussaint died from pneumonia, and in December of 1941, Blanche died due to aortitis. In their will, Marie was listed as their only heir. Marie was also the named beneficiary of the wills of her cousins Pauline Bodineau and Virginie Laleron. On July 1, 1945, Pauline, who was 88 years old, apparently mistook a bowl of little lye for a bowl of dessert and died. A week later, Virginie allegedly did exactly the same thing and died. Six months later, Marie's mother, Marie-Louise Davelaud, also died, January 16, 1946. At one point, Marie discovered Leon had been having an affair with another woman. Leon claimed to a friend that he thought Marie was poisoning him, saying she had served some soup to him one night, but there was already a liquid in the bowl before she poured the soup. Shortly afterwards, on October 25, 1947, Leon was dead. The cause given was uremia. Because of the claims of poisoning Leon had made, the gendarmerie ordered an investigation and an autopsy was conducted. The forensic surgeon found that Leon's body contained 19.45 milligrams of arsenic. Marie was promptly arrested and all other suspicious deaths around her were exhumed and re-examined. Every single one was found to have ingested arsenic in large quantities. This led to Marie being charged with 13 counts of murder. The autopsy reports showed that each victim had been poisoned by arsenic slowly over a period of time. At that time though, it was difficult to prove this as toxicology was a relatively new science. And Barrod, 
the forensic surgeon had difficulty explaining his results and defending them when questioned on the stand by the defense lawyers. For this reason, the first two trials resulted in no conviction. She was placed on trial a third time in 1961. However, the defense was once again successful in undermining the relevance of the arsenic evidence and Marie was acquitted of all of the murders. It may seem that she shouldn't be considered a serial killer without a conviction, but the evidence found is against her, and had she been tried in today's legal system, she would have been most likely convicted based on the autopsy findings. Marie Besnard died in 1980, presumably from natural causes. She remained a free woman until her death. Martha Rendell In 1909, Martha Rendell was tried convicted, and hanged for one of the most extraordinary and horrific crimes seen by Western Australia police. Rendell was the common-law wife of Thomas Morris, and she cold-bloodedly murdered three of his children by swabbing their throats with spirits of salts, otherwise known as hydrochloric acid. Although the children died slow and agonizing deaths, they had been treated by a number of doctors during their illness only one of whom had expressed any doubts on their deaths. Born in Adelaide, Southern Australia, Rendell would grow to become a young woman who didn't follow the rules and conventions of society at that time. Unusually, she had moved out of the family home when she was just 16 years old and quickly gave birth to three illegitimate babies. This made her an outsider to society as promiscuity was a terrible sin. She then became involved with a married man, Thomas Nichols Morris. Thomas and his wife had nine children, and in the mid-1890s, he started his affair with Rendell. In 1900, Thomas had to go where the work was and move his family to Perth, Western Australia. They also left because rumors were spreading around the small town of his affair with Rendell. Rendell, not willing to give up her affair with Thomas, left her own children behind and followed Thomas and his wife to Perth. At the period in time, divorce was not a possibility, so there was no way Thomas could divorce his wife and be with Rendell. It was considered a sin to divorce as Christian marriage was the foundation of the state and of the welfare of its citizens and their happiness and prosperity. A federal divorce bill had been proposed but was quickly voted against. Rendell and Thomas, however, continued their affair until he finally left his wife in 1906. Although they couldn't divorce, they could separate. He took the five youngest children with him and set up a house with Rendell. By now, their affair had been going on for more than 10 years, and it seemed Rendell finally had what she had always wanted. But it wasn't all wonderful as she had thought it would be. They moved to East Perth to a neighborhood where few would ask questions, and Rendell posed as Thomas's wife. Although they were together at last, they were living in dire poverty, and Rendell spent all her time cleaning and taking care of the children. The children were resentful towards Rendell as they most likely missed their mother who had been refused contact with them. The children were either too young or too busy to help out around the home, and Rendell was alone most of the time, with no family or friends. Unhappy with her lot in life and fed up with the challenges of the children, Rendell took matters into her own hands to try and get the life she wanted. Little seven-year-old Annie was the first of the children to die at the hands of their stepmother. Rendell first put something into Annie's food to make her throat sore. Then she would swab what she called medicine on the back of her throat. The medicine was actually hydrochloric acid, which made the throat so inflamed the child was unable to eat. Annie essentially starved to death on July 28, 1907. When the doctor filled out the death certificate, he listed diphtheria as the cause of death. A few months later, on October 6, 1907, Olive died in the same manner and once again, the cause of death was determined to be diphtheria. Rendell then waited for a period of time before taking care of the youngest child living, Arthur. He was 14 at the time and it took longer for Rendell's treatment to work. After his death on October 6, 1908, 
the doctor asked for an autopsy to be performed. Randall agreed, but only if she could witness the process. The doctors didn't find anything incriminating. Randall waited until April 1909 before she decided to end the life of another child, George. She gave him a cup of tea, and almost straight away he complained of having a sore throat. Randall swabbed the acid on the back of his throat, which scared George so much, he ran off to his mother's home. The crimes only came to light in April 1909 when a brother, George Morris, was reported missing and neighbors expressed concerns as his two sisters and a brother had died in suspicious circumstances. Detective Sergeant Mann and Constable Lamont took over inquiries and found George at his mother's home. He claimed to have run away because his stepmother had killed his siblings and was trying to poison him with spirits of salt. The inquiry was hampered by the period of time that had elapsed since the deaths and because doctors could not say what effect swabbing with spirits of salt would have. Suspicions were further aroused when it was shown that Rendell had purchased large quantities of spirits of salts during the period of the children's illnesses, but none since the last death. Because there had been a fairly long period since the last child died, the only way to check to see if they were murdered was to exhume the bodies. This was done on July 3, 1909, and the autopsy showed there had been poisoning of the children but there was still no proof of Rendell swabbing their throats. Autopsies showed that a poison had been administered and this had caused inflammation and hemorrhage of the bowel. However, it was not until dozens of witnesses had been questioned that a neighbor gave evidence that through a window, she had seen Rendell swabbing Arthur Morris's throat and had heard his agonized screams and cries for help. On a visit to Rendell, she had smelled the bottle and experienced strong fumes and burning, but Rendell claimed that a doctor had prescribed the medication. So they experimented with guinea pigs and rabbits, and the results were the same as was seen on the children's autopsies. Rendell was arrested along with her husband Thomas, and both were initially charged with the murders of the children. Thomas was eventually acquitted, but Rendell was found guilty and sentenced to death. No motive could be found apart from Rendell's infatuation with Morris and her anger at the children's disobedience. Although Thomas Morris was also charged with the murders, he was acquitted as it was believed that although he had purchased spirits of salts, he had not been aware of the crimes until after the children's deaths. However, he had lied to police and to the coroner, and the jury wanted to find him guilty of being an accessory after the fact, but this was not allowed. On October 6, 1909, Rendell was taken to the gallows at Fremantle Prison and hanged at 8 a.m. She never showed any guilt or remorse for the crimes she had committed. She was buried in Fremantle Cemetery. Hey everyone, I just wanted to express how grateful I am that you took the time to listen to my narration. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I am Twisted Mind and please enjoy the rest of your day. Salamat. Thank you for joining me in the premiere, Eriza Miguel, Miss Cafe Latte, Tess Atienza, Poor Incai, Aubrey Delgado, Amo John, Eliseo Sa Avedra, DreamWorks Stories, Gracia and Everything TV, Miss Colette, Disturbed Spirit, Kit Kat Yami Choco, Tats Key Blogs, Mara Padilla, and Tales from Creepinoy. Marami pong salamat. And also, marami rin po salamat for taking the time to comment and sharing with me words of encouragement. Aubrey Delgado, Eriza Miguel, Tessa Tienza, Pinoy Shocking Stories, Stick the Law of Stories, Jasper Reed Stories, Ms. Colette, Unicorn Blood Version 2, Eris Crib Horror Tales, Pinoy Sad Love Stories, Ben Jose, Abigail Sofia, Ray Frenella, and Bray Francis. I apologize if I mispronounce any of your names. Again, maraming 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 salamat po. Have a blessed day.